so we are in the midst of this series that's all about doctrine. And uh, as I said with the kids, doctrine can be a, a funny word, it can be a word that has all kinds of things associated with it, but least of all, it's exciting, right? Uh, we, uh, we sort of shy away, or at least a few shy away, I understand, because doctrinal classes at the seminary aren't usually exciting. But the thing is, when it comes to our relationship with God, remember, this, this whole faith thing is about relationship. When it comes to our relationship with God, it's hard to have a relationship with someone you don't know or you don't understand. And so doctrine becomes very important, especially when we break it down into a, a practical kind of an understanding. Doctrine helps to form that relationship, helps us to, to have stronger connection. But the thing is, when it comes to Christian doctrine, sometimes our Christian doctrines are a little bit strange. So, for example, last week we talked about God who is one but three. But when you understand what the Bible has to say about that, you really begin to understand that the whole idea of one God but Father, Son, and Holy Spirit really helps us understand how God is a part of every aspect of our lives, how He never leaves us and He never forsakes us, but is engaged with our lives in every part. That strengthens our relationship. Next week, we're going to talk about a, a kind of a strange doctrine, how we can be bad and good at the same time. But when we understand that, and we understand how God interacts and deals with us and deals with our strengths and our weaknesses, our, our, our good parts and our broken parts, it strengthens that relationship. That's really the goal. Not just to teach you what the church teaches, but to share with you what that teaching is and how it relates to our individual lives and our individual relationship with God. So today we're going to talk about Jesus. And it's, a, it's kind of a strange doctrine. In fact, the, the official term is the hypostatic union in Christ. Now that sounds very engaging, doesn't it? <laughs> hypostatic union in Christ, essentially the doctrine that teaches us that Jesus has two natures. That he is fully God and he is fully man. Well, that doesn't make any sense to us. So what we want to do is sort of break that down. But you know, when it comes to Jesus, the, the reality is Jesus himself, who he is and what he is and, and, and what we should know about him and what he really did and what he didn't do, that's a, that's a topic of lots of controversy and lots of dialogue even in our culture. It's important that every person, every person, whether they are believer or non-believer, that every person ask and answer the question, who was Jesus? Because think about it. Whether you believe in him or not, or not Jesus has had a profound impact throughout history. In fact, Jesus and, and his followers, the church, Christianity, have had a profound impact that we experience to this very day. I found this great quote that talks about that very thing. It says, The character of Jesus not only has the highest pattern of virtue, but the strongest incentive to its practice, and has exerted so deep an influence that it may be truly said that the simple record of three short years of active life has done more to regenerate and to soften mankind than all the disquisitions of philosophers and more than all of the exhortations of moralists. Don't you love that word, disquisitions? But what he's saying is that, that Jesus, three short years of his life and his teaching and the, the accounts that we have of that have changed who we are and regenerated human beings has caused a, a, a bigger impact on our world and our culture than any of the other teachers, leaders, generals, great people. When you think about it, it's true. But that, that whole idea of coming to grips with Jesus and, and what you believe about him may also explain what happens when someone like Barna, you know the Barna organization, they do lots of surveys and studies and opinion polls and so forth, and Barna does lots having to do with culture and religion and faith. So Barna did a study and they asked people, do you believe that Jesus was a real person, an actual person who actually lived? And then they broke down the results based on uh, generations. And so you see on this chart, so at the top of all people, com combination, average of all generations, 92% said, yeah, we believe Jesus was a real person who actually lived. 
And then you see as we break it down into millennials, Gen Xers, boomers, and elders, the numbers change. But it's pretty profound to think that 92 out of every 100 people believe that Jesus really did live, that he was a real person. But this is where it becomes interesting. Because while they believe that Jesus was a real person who really lived, then they ask the next question, do you believe that he was God? And they use the same generational breakdown to sort of divide it out with that same average of all of them and take a look at what they found. It's that black part of the circle that, that says, people said, yeah, we believe he was really God. And so you see, of all adults that were surveyed, a little over half said, yeah, we think he really was God. And the numbers changed based on generation, just like those who said, yeah, we believe he was a real person. But there's a big distinction, right? Right? Between 92% who said that they believe he really did live and a little over 50% who say that he was God. So there's confusion. There's a, a certain lack of clarity. And I think it becomes really important for you and I to understand what we believe about him. You know, it is fascinating, though, to realize that, that when it comes to Jesus, before Jesus in ancient culture... Just for example, children were viewed as property. So for example, a, a, the head of a household could decide, usually within the first eight days of a child's life, they could decide whether that child would live or not. In fact, if they decided that, the child, that they didn't want the child for whatever reason, they would take them and they called it exposure. They would expose this child to the elements and just leave them out somewhere in the out of doors. And those children, in an overwhelming majority, would die. And the reason that a, that a head of a household could use is that a, a child had a deformity, child had some kind of disfigurement, child seemed to be lacking in some way, or it could just simply be that, that the child was illegitimate, or that that additional child would dilute the inheritance to the other children too much or cause, cause dissension. And that head of the household could virtually for any reason say, we don't want this child, and let it die. Well, what happened since Jesus? Well, Jesus came and, and said, let the little children come to me. We just talked about that, right, in baptism. Jesus said, if anyone doesn't receive the kingdom of heaven like this little child, they won't enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus reaffirmed the teaching of Judaism that really had had no impact on the culture at that point where he said children are a blessing from the Lord. And lo and behold, his followers believed that. His followers implemented that. And it changed the whole view of culture, the whole view to this very day where, where children are viewed as precious and beloved and to be protected and cared for and loved no matter what their struggles might be. Results in our culture with things like neonatal intensive care units and orphanages and all kinds of agencies that protect children. That's a huge impact. It changed the trajectory of our culture's view on children in an opposite direction. Absolutely turned it around in a totally different direction. But that's not all. When you think about people who, who struggle with disabilities or infirmity, or people who, who are impoverished. Remember, in the ancient world before Jesus, they were considered outcasts, and if they were allowed to survive, they were usually enslaved. And Jesus came along and said, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. He, he gave them value, and he gave them worth, and he said that they were important, and that they should be cared for and loved, and lo and behold, his followers believed that, and it changed, changed the direction of the culture. So that now there are all kinds of ministries and agencies and organizations and efforts to help people who are sick and infirmed and, and disabled. I mean, think about it. Just when it comes to sick people, instead of being outcasts, we now have hospitals. And if you think about the names of the three most prominent hospitals in our community, Lutheran, Baptist system and Methodist system, those are named after groups of followers of Jesus. I mean, his influence is huge, even today. One other interesting little difference that, that I really didn't even realize until Pastor Zach was talking about it on Thursday or Friday is that in light of Jesus' resurrection, so before Jesus' resurrection, People were, were buried, and there was no hope, right? They were buried, and they were laid to rest. They, they had gone to be with their ancestors. 
But after Jesus, after his resurrection, everything changed. In fact, remember the encounter where Jesus is, is face-to-face with a, a family, and they have a little girl who's died. And Jesus says to that family and to the folks who had gathered to mourn her passing, she's not dead, she's asleep. If you remember, some of the people were outraged and some of the people mocked him for it. But the reality is he, he raised that little girl back to life. In light of, of this, before that time, places where people were buried had one particular name, but afterwards they became known as cemeteries. And what's fascinating is the Greek root of the word cemetery means a sleeping place. The impact of Jesus is profound, even to this day. In fact, there's this, this awesome quote. It says, Socrates taught for 40 years, Plato for 50, Aristotle for 40, and Jesus for only three. Yet the influence of Christ's three-year ministry infinitely transcends the impact left by the combined 130 years of teaching from these men who were among the greatest philosophers of all antiquity. Jesus pointed, painted no pictures, yet some of his finest paintings of Raphael, Michelangelo, and Leonardo da Vinci received their inspiration from Jesus. Jesus wrote no poetry, but Dante, Milton, and scores of the world's greatest poets were inspired by him. Jesus composed no music. Still Hayden, Handel, Beethoven, Bach, and Mendelssohn reached their highest perfection of melody in their hymns and their symphonies they composed in his praise. Every sphere of human greatness has been, been enriched by this humble carpenter of Nazareth. Jesus has an enormous influence. And so it becomes important that every person, believer and non-believer, they come to grips with the impact of Jesus and Christianity in his name, and they answer the question, who was Jesus? So this morning, that brings us to our text. And our text this morning is from the book of Colossians in the New Testament. It's one of the earliest books that was written in the entire New Testament. It was written by the Apostle Paul. Paul was the first church planner. Paul was a missionary. And literally, Paul was one of the first to write about Jesus and, and record his thoughts and encounters. But he spells out here in chapter 1 of Colossians what he believes about Jesus. He says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. That's Paul telling us what he believes about Jesus. And so what I want to do is break that down because Paul tells us essentially two significant things about Jesus. So you will be amazed to realize that I only have two main points for you this morning. It's a shock, you'll get over it. But I do want you to write these down. Because here's the thing, if Jesus has had such an influence on our culture, and yet there's such a, a misunderstanding of who he is and, and what he is, if you write these things down, these biblical points out of Scripture, and, and you have an understanding, it will help you in conversation to not only say what you believe about Jesus, but why. So point number one, Paul says Jesus is God. You, you know it immediately from what he says. I mean, just look at some of the statements. He is the image of the invisible God. Well, literally, it's what Jesus said, right? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He is the image of the invisible God. Verse 16, everything was created by him. And it doesn't take much of a connection to realize that if you go to Genesis 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In John chapter 1, it said that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and everything that was created was created through Him. All of a sudden, we realize that with everything being created by Him, Paul's saying, I believe He's God. Verse 19, God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him. That the fullness of God dwelt in the man, Jesus. Jesus. 
Paul's saying, I believe he is God. Now, here's the interesting thing. You remember back in the days when we used to say, man, if it's printed in the newspaper, it's true. Tongue in cheek, right? Or the same joke a little bit later on, you know, if, if you see it on TV, it must be true. Right? Tongue in cheek. Well, now, if you see it on the internet, it's got to be true. Not. So maybe you're sitting here and saying to yourself, well, just because Paul says it, it doesn't mean that it's true. So what do we do with that? How do we kind of wrap our minds around whether or not it's true? Just because Paul says it doesn't mean it is. But, but the thing is, remember something else about Paul. Paul wasn't just the first missionary, the first, the first uh, church planner, the, one of the first to write about Jesus. Paul was also not always a follower of Jesus. In fact, Paul began as somebody who was glad that Jesus was dead and wanted to get rid of as many of his followers as he possibly could. Paul signed himself up for a mission to absolutely decimate this new church called The Way. He wanted to do everything in his power to punish the followers of Jesus until one day on the road to Damascus, the risen Jesus appeared to him, and it changed everything. And so Paul goes on to give us a a sense of proof for what he believes. It's not, not that we just believe. Paul tells us, this is why I believe. And one of the reasons that Paul believes is because Jesus resurrected from the dead, appeared to him. In fact, Paul says in verse 18, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. So Paul is is claiming Jesus died and he rose from the dead. But it's not just that. Paul is saying not only has Jesus died and rose again, but Jesus died and and all those who trust in him will also be rising in the future. That, That literally Jesus, through his resurrection, opened the possibility of resurrection for all of us who come after him. So what does that all mean? Well, Paul's saying if Jesus can predict his death and his resurrection, and it happens exactly the way he said it would happen, you got to believe that whatever this guy says is true. I mean, realize it. Jesus predicted his death and his resurrection. That, that boils him down into an extremely small category of human beings who have ever lived. In fact, the number of the human beings who have ever predicted their death and, and, and their resurrection and accomplished it is one. In all of history, One. And Paul is saying, if, if, Jesus, if Jesus can do this, then we ought to believe the rest of what he says. So when he says, for example, in John 6, verse 38, I have come down from heaven, we ought to believe that he really did because he did something that no human being could possibly do without power, the, the power of the divine in him. And so Paul's saying, I believe because of this. I believe because Jesus rose from the dead. In fact, it's interesting Paul, in in his writing to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he writes this whole chapter. It's called the Resurrection Chapter. And it's one of those chapters, you may not memorize it, but you really should be familiar with it. And 1 Corinthians 15 talks about the resurrection of Jesus and the power and the importance and the significance. And one of the things that Paul says is that if Jesus is not raised from the dead, then we're wasting our time. That literally our faith and our hope rises and falls based on the truth of the resurrection. In fact, that's why this morning I want to take just a little detour. And I want to share with you, there there are many proofs, reasons to believe the resurrection is true. I want to share with you three this morning. These are three that you can, again, write down, make a note of them. Because they're simple to understand, but they're really powerful. So, number one, reason why you should believe the resurrection, the tomb was empty. Now you say, well, what? Well, remember, when Jesus died and Joseph of Marimathea laid him in his tomb, the religious leaders insisted that there be guards posted. They sealed the tomb with Pilate's signet. And they posted guards to watch and to make sure that that those disciples 
couldn't play any shenanigans. They couldn't play any games. They couldn't steal the body and claim that he was raised or that something crazy had happened. And lo and behold, they posted those guards. But in spite of that, the next day on Easter morning, what happened? The tomb was empty. But this is where it gets really interesting. So in Matthew's Gospel, verse 28, it says, After the priests had assembled with the elders and agreed on a plan, they gave the soldiers, the soldiers that had, that had been guarding the tomb, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money and told them, say this, his disciples came during the night and stole him while we were sleeping. So despite the guards and despite the seal on the tomb, the body was gone. The tomb was empty. But not only that, they know that the tomb was empty despite those guards, and so they conspire, they, they create a plan, and they bribe the guards to say that the body was stolen because they know that it wasn't stolen. Jesus was raised from the dead. Proof number two. He was seen by lots of people. Remember, I said 1 Corinthians 15 is that resurrection chapter? Well, one of the interesting things is that, that Paul gives some of these proofs in 1 Corinthians 15, and one of the things that he says to everybody who's, who's, that he's going to preach to, he says, hey, listen, he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive. What's he saying? He's saying, listen, if you don't believe this, it wasn't that long ago. He appeared to 500 people at one time. So lest you think that it was some kind of delusion or some kind of imagination, literally 500 people saw him at the same time. And if you have any doubts about it, go and talk to them because they'll tell you. He's saying there were lots and lots of eyewitnesses who saw the risen Christ. Dear friends, we put great value in eyewitness testimony. Paul's saying, listen, if you don't believe my word, just go check with the 500 people who saw him at the same time after his resurrection. Now, there's one more, and, and this is really in the context of how Jesus has changed the course of history. This last proof th for the resurrection is really intriguing because it, 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 the idea is his impact on history is strange. This is what I mean. Great leaders great teachers, great philosophers, great military people. They have an impact on history, but as, as time passes, their influence gets smaller. John Ortberg has written a, a cool book. It's called Who Is This Man? It might be something that you'd like to read. He's a great preacher, great teacher, but it's called Who Is This Man? And he writes this. Normally when someone dies, their impact on the world immediately begins to recede. Right? They're dead. They, they really don't influence the world, and they, they grow less and less and less in their influence until they become a story in a history book and ultimately a footnote in a history book. Normally, when someone dies, their impact on the world immediately begins to recede, but Jesus inverted this normal human trajectory as he did in so many others. Jesus' impact was greater 100 years after his death than during his life. It was greater still after 500 years. After 1,000 years, his legacy laid the foundation for much of Europe. After 2,000 years, he has more followers in more places than ever. It's not normal. All of these other great people who lived and died, their influence became less and less, and Jesus is exactly the opposite. The longer he's gone, the greater his influence. And I would suggest to you the reason for that is all of those other great people died. Jesus died, but he didn't stay dead. He rose again, and that's why his influence continues to grow. That's why there, there are so many people who believe in him to this day in so many different places in the world. See, Paul ultimately believes that Jesus is God because Paul saw him face to face. On the road to Damascus, as Paul was on his way to persecute the church and persecute the followers of Jesus, he had an encounter with the risen Christ and it changed everything. And Paul is convinced Jesus is God. Point number two, Paul teaches us Jesus is human. 
you know, Pastor Zach and Pastor Ben and, and the other pastors on staff were, were going through this preaching course. It's a course that's, that's put on by Kerry Newhoff. He's a, a pastor and teacher and lecturer and a great preacher. And so we're going through this trying to hone our skills and improve our preaching and our communication. And one of the interesting quotes from Kerry Newhoff is this, people admire your strengths, but they resonate with your weaknesses. Now, what's that mean? Well, it means people can, when, when we see people and we hear people and we watch people, if, if they've got all of these strengths and all of this ability and all of these talents, we can admire them and respect them and think they're awesome, but we don't necessarily connect with them. It's when we see the, the weaknesses that people have that cause us to begin to identify with them and feel like there's a connection. In fact, one of the, one of the powerful things about the Stars Retreat Men just came back from it, and, and one of the reasons that you can see it was such a great experience for them, and while, by the way, I have to, just a little caveat, I'm not allowed to give away all of the deep secrets of the Stars Retreat. But I can give you a general principle, and the principle is this. These men have not only spent time with God, they've spent time with other brothers in Christ who have been open and candid and honest about their life about their struggles, about the work of God in their lives, about their relationship with Jesus. So they're not just hearing all of these amazing things about how God is great and, and they're awesome Christian people because of it. They're hearing about real people with real hurts and real wounds and real pain and real struggles who've, blessed by an, who've been blessed by an awesome God who has loved them and healed them and forgiven them and lifted them up. You understand the difference? It creates this resonant. It creates this, this connectedness. Because all of a sudden, they're, they're having an, a person, a place, a way to identify with someone else who's just like them. Paul continues in Colossians chapter 1, verse 22. Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds, alienated from God and hostile toward God in your minds. In your minds you expressed, pardon me, in your minds, expressed in your evil actions. But now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death. Notice how he's very specific. It says Jesus had a physical body that died. Well, there's a reason for that. He wants us to understand that he was really human. He was just like us and had a physical body. In fact, it's interesting, in the church, in history, there are these things called heresies. And heresies are false teachings. So instead of a true teaching, this is a false teaching. And heresies are usually false teachings that are condemned by the church. And one of the false teachings in the history of the church is called docetism. Docetism, in short, says that Jesus was truly God but he was not truly human. He didn't have a human body. In fact, essentially in our, in our language, Jesus was ultimately this amazing hologram. Looked like he was human, but he really wasn't. And the church ultimately said, absolutely not. That's not what the Bible teaches. It's not true. But that's a really important deal because if you and I have a God who is, or a Savior who is just God, that we can respect and, and honor and, and be amazed by him, but we can't connect to him. We can't trust that he really understands who we are and what we struggle with. In fact, I have a friend who speaks to lots of different groups and does lots of mentoring and training and equipping. And, and one of the things that he says when he's talking about presentations is that people don't care what you know until they know that you care. What's he saying? Well, you can have amazing, an amazing message to share with people, but until they feel like they can connect to you, until they feel like they matter, like their real issues are real issues to you, they don't want to hear it. Dear friends, that's the point of Jesus being human. He is fully God. He's got all the power of God, but he became one of us so that we could be absolutely assured he understands what it's like to be you and me. He understands all of the struggles of fatigue. He understands what it's like to be hurting. He understands what it's like to be hungry. He understands what it's like to be exhausted beyond the point of recognition. He understands all of the struggles we have. In fact, I love the way the, the preacher in the book of Hebrews puts it. 
We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are. Our high priest is Jesus, and and we don't have a high priest who, who can't sympathize, who doesn't understand. He understands exactly what it's like to be us, and he has been tempted in every way just like us. But notice the last, the last phrase, yet without sin. Because he is truly God, he never crossed that line, and, and he never violated the will of God. And so the truth is, he's tempted, and he understands, and he gets what it's like to be us, but he never sinned so he can be our Savior. Jesus is truly God and truly man. Now, just one more thing. Pastor Ben is awesome, right? And one of the great ways that I get to tag team with Pastor Ben is, is for confirmation, and in particular for confirmation interviews. And uh, the way it works is Pastor Ben gets to be good cop and I get to be bad cop, which really doesn't seem fair now that I think about it. But what we've been doing for the last few years is that there's kind of a two-stage interview. So the kids will come upstairs, and they'll meet with Pastor Ben, and he'll do an interview with them, and he'll get to know them a little better, and he'll, he'll sort of help them and review stuff with them and give them some encouragement and, and prepare them and give them confidence for the torture session that comes next. <laughs> and one of the ways that he helps prepare them for this whole issue of, of who Jesus is and whether or not we can trust him is that he uses this great illustration tells the kids that Jesus is 100% God, and he is also 100% man. And so Jesus is literally the only person who's ever been a 200% person. Isn't that a great, simple way to teach that? I mean, I wish the early church fathers would have known this, Zach. We should put in some kind of complaint. That's simple. It's easy to understand. Hypostatic union, let's call it the 200% man union, Right? But that's how Pastor Ben helps them to understand this, that Jesus is the 200% person. Why? Why would God provide for us a 200% person as Savior? Well, in John chapter 10, verse 10, he tells us why. In fact, he tells us not only his purpose, he tells us the purpose of the devil, the the thief who comes. He says the purpose of the thief is to steal and kill and destroy. The devil doesn't want anything good for you. He wants to ruin your life and he wants to ruin your eternity. But Jesus goes on. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. You know what that means? Jesus who is 100% God and Jesus who is 100% man is 100% for us. Now that's really a big deal. Because you and I struggle to be 100% human, right? Leave the God part across. We've got no opportunity there. We struggle to be 100% human. We've got all kinds of brokenness and all kinds of flaws and all kinds of bad attitudes and all kinds of stuff. We've got fears and confusions and uncertainties. We've got all this stuff that, that diminishes our life. So God has given us a 200% person so that we might have a rich and satisfying life. That's his purpose. In fact, I love how Paul concludes this section. The Jesus who died in his body, his blood shed on the cross paid the price, made the sacrifice. So here's the thing. If Jesus isn't truly a man, then it's hard for us to ever trust that he understands our life and our struggle. And if Jesus isn't truly God, then then what's the point in trusting him? He can't really help us with all of the big issues we face. But if he is both, if Jesus is both God and human, then we can trust him. We can trust him with our life, and we can trust him with our eternity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, that's what we want. We want to trust you. 
We want to trust your son, Jesus. We want to trust your spirit at work in our lives. And so, Lord, as we've, as we've studied this doctrine, I pray that you would make it much more than doctrine. I pray that you would transfer it into faith, that it would become an unshakable confidence in our lives so that in every circumstance, we know you get us and understand us. But we know that you are with us with a power that's beyond our imagination to give us rich and fulfilling lives and eternity. Lord, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, dear friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And as you leave this place, go into the world and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out this message of life. Amen.